trustees to order a quorum of board members is present. This meeting has been duly called and notice of the meeting has been posted in accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551. Please rise and join me in the pledge to the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the, to the flag, flag of, of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And the Texas flag? Honor, Honor the, the Texas, Texas flag. flag. I, I pledge allegiance to the Texas, Texas one state under God, one and indivisible. Is this me? All right, thank you all. And to get us started, we have Jared and Kurt here from O'Connell Robertson to give us a bond project update. Welcome, gentlemen. All right, thank you all for your time. We've got the four projects we're going to go over today, and you know the two of them are really just getting under full steam. We have one of the projects that's going to be wrapping up in the next few weeks, and we have one project that actually just wrapped up last week. So it's kind of nice the contractors are on board and we're all teamwork is uh, working well. And these last two projects that are finishing up right now have been a great success. So the first project we have is the Charter Oak Elementary School on Poison Oak Road. Um, and you look at the photos that we had last month, it was basically a, a tinker toy. You know, we had the stick building going up and you know, that's really all you see is the framing. You can see the concrete, how they protected it for the stained concrete. But beyond that, there was not a lot going on in the building. But one thing I will point out, and oops, go back. So right here, this is actually where the gymnasium and the cafeteria is. So we go to the next image. This top right image is actually inside that gymnasium and cafeteria area. So over the last month, they've actually finished putting on the metal decking from the north side classroom pod moving to the south. Uh, they've installed all the skylight openings. They've got the structural studs and all the studs around the perimeter of the building from the north side to the gymnasium have been installed, along with the sheathing board having installed, which you can see in the uh, bottom right picture, which is the blue. Since I took these photos, they've actually got most of the waterproofing on the exterior of the building. And in the next week, they're going to actually be ready to start erecting the masonry around the building. So by the next time we come, we'll have some photos of the exterior with the masonry and some of the stone going on the exterior of the building. What else has been going on is basically all the work that's going above ceiling. So we have the metal duct for the HVAC system. We have the fire uh, sprinkler lines that have been installed. We have all the conduits. Uh, and in the first classroom pod on the north side of the site, all those classrooms have actually been framed out with metal studs. The data drops, the conduits for the boxes are all installed. So we've been able to kind of get a feel of what the actual volume of the space is and walk through. So if you actually were out there, you could go in one of the classrooms, you'd kind of understand where the teaching wall is, where the hallway and the circulation is. Are there any questions on this one? The next one is the Fine Arts Center renovation next door. And so the last time we were here, we looked and had the photos of you know, the flat work going on, on the outside, the steps and the ramps. The interior, you can see on the right image there that there was no flooring down. They had the walls painted. Uh, they had all the sound panels up along the perimeter of the building. But really, it didn't look like a space yet. During the last month, they've got all the seating, all the flooring installed. So it actually now, you look in there, it's about two weeks from being finished. We anticipate by the end of the month that it'll be hit in substantial completion. And then when you come in the main doors, you've got that Belton ISD logo along the casework. So like I said, the next uh, milestone for that will be substantial completion. It's going to wrap up in about two weeks. Um, and it's been a great project, and we're, we're happy to see it completed for you all. Do you have any questions on this one? So the next project is Lakewood Elementary, the music classroom and gymnasium edition. And this project actually did hit a milestone last week, and we hit substantial completion. Uh, so that it was ready for the first day of school. So when we last were here a month ago, the exterior masonry had been erected. They were still had some finishing touches to put up the metal panel, finish laying ceiling tiles, and get everything buttoned up. And as you can see, all the gymnasium flooring was installed, the striping. They have all the sound panels going around the gym. All the backboards and wall padding had been installed. Canopies on the outside. And then the, you know, the little detail things, like in the alcove, the nice bright pop of red around the drinking fountains. Um, so hopefully today, all the kids were able to use it and have a lot of fun in that space, and we're really proud that it was completed. 
And the last project is Lake Belton High School. Um, and this one, kind of looking at the photos, there's really, it's kind of hard to see the progress that's happened out there. Because when you look at the photos on the bottom here, you just see a lot of dirt being moved around. But what I will point out is on this bottom right photo, you can see the grade differential between the higher level and the lower level. <clears throat> well, over the last month, they've actually installed the retaining wall between those two levels, which is this little center picture down here, which is way over here on this uh, overall aerial. You really don't see a lot, but they've done a lot. Uh, most of the stuff is below grade. They've got the piers installed to about 95% of them. Uh, they begin e excavating the foundations around some of the different slabs. And in the next couple of weeks, they're going to be moving to the athletics section down here and really fine grading and getting the grades up for the baseball, the softball, and the football field. Um, and then the bottom right corner is actually they have the, uh, the auditorium, not the auditorium, the, uh, the orchestra pit has been poured. And they've already started forming up the walls on that one to get that to the next level. And then the bottom left photo is just for note, is that uh, that was one of the Temple's projects of rerouting of the county road. And one of the biggest coordination things that we had was making sure they just got that section in for school to start, because that was the bus, bus pass from the existing county road across. And it had been torn up for the last four months. So as you can see, they actually poured just the little section so the buses are able to get in and go around the drive. Are there any questions? So that's looking back toward Temple in that last picture you were this one referencing this here yeah where the yeah so this is, is um, okay. if you were down here is actually the water tower okay. so it's looking back in gotcha mm -hmm. on the lakewood i didn't i can't tell from the pictures is that the gym board is wooden vinyl plank what y'all put in there this time that so is that it's the it, like a five millimeter target floor so it looks okay. like wood but it's got the cushion to it yeah. waterproof awesome mm -hmm. yeah. Nice. Yeah, we walked through this morning. It's absolutely gorgeous. Jared, I have to commend you for the gym. It really accomplished what we um, wanted to accomplish in that we got the back entryway for the bus riders. And um, we were able to have that connection around to the front and we got the curb appeal we were looking for for Lakewood Elementary. So that was really um, well done. Thank you. Re really great design. It's Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Well done. Thank you, yes. Yeah, awesome. Me lead this one. Okay. Yeah, next up is a uh, discussion on the attendance boundary parameters. So, yeah. Okay, I'm going to do that from right here if you don't mind. Um, last month, Bob Templeton was here and met with us and discussed attendance boundaries parameters and from that um, is the attached list um, that we want to review this evening in preparation for our very first attendance boundaries meeting, which will be next Monday evening. Um, so there were six, um, and I do realize we left one off, but we can talk about that when we get to the end of the list. Um, the first one was to design attendance zones to last five years, to make the best effort to keep subdivisions together, um, to make efficient use of buildings to reduce overcrowding when possible. In other words, we want to use the facilities that we have to the greatest extent. Number four, design boundaries that facilitate efficient transportation routes, giving consideration to minimizing ride times. Number five, to attempt to use natural boundary lines when possible. And number six, develop boundaries that support balanced demographics to the extent possible, considering subdivisions and travel time for students and families. And we, um, we also discussed feeder patterns, um, and so I'd be happy to add that one, um, working towards feeder patterns if possible. So I'll get that one added. Anything else that would be important to the board as we uh, begin our work with our committee next week? That it? I got a yeah. quick question. Yeah. Um, just as far as board responsibilities on that, you want us just kind of there to listen and take in information? That's correct. Not so, to necessarily guide the conversation. Correct. So these um, are um, um, posted board meetings, 
And as Bob explained last time, the board's role is to listen um, to the community and to try not to guide the, the committee in one way or the other. It's the committee's recommendation to the board, um, but you're there so that you can hear the conversation in the context of the meeting um, and, and get a feel for where the community is headed. Listening, listening is your main role. So these parameters are the board's priorities for the committee. They'll set the foundation for what the committee starts with and what they'll focus on trying to accomplish, knowing that um, you know there'll have to be some give and take on some of these, um, more than likely, um, just because all of them together would be a bit challenging to accomplish what everyone wants. Um, as we've talked about before, this process is um, it's just that, it's quite a process. So have a lot of patience um, and understanding, an open mind, um, but these, I think, uh, when we add the, uh, the feeder um, priority to them, I think these are, are a good start uh, of reflecting our priorities. If there is something else that you wanna see in here, now's the time to throw it out there because the first meeting is next, Monday. Next Monday. Next Monday evening. So the goal for the first meeting will be um, for the committee to get to know each other, for us to um, review the progress of our bond programs, to bring everyone up to speed on what we've done so far. Um, Bob Templeton and Michelle Burden will also review our demographic projections and provide that information to the committee and then we'll talk about these parameters. I'm not sure that we'll get to maps on the first evening. Um, it'll take a while for us to do those other things first, and then this, by the second meeting, we'll be able to jump into some scenario maps. And Michelle's been working on those already um, and has, um, has some pretty good uh, scenarios to at least to, as a starting point for us. So it'll be Mr. Templeton and, and Dr. Muller will be the two uh, running the meeting? Myself, um, Dr. Muller, and uh, Bob Templeton and Michelle uh, Burden with Templeton Demographics. And she's really the one who's doing the work with the mapping system that they're using. And she's very talented, so I feel really good about um, her ability to maneuver lines and let us see what, how things look. What other questions about that? Anything else? I definitely encourage everyone to attend as many of the uh, Boundary Committee meetings as you can because it's a great opportunity to get valuable feedback, to have valuable discussion. Um, like I said, it is quite a process. People will come to the first meeting with their mind made up uh, on occasion and, and want to jump straight to the solution, um, but be patient with the process. It's a great way to go about it. Um, but come with uh, your thoughts and ideas as well, uh, understanding that this committee process is very valuable and it will give us good feedback for the board to make a decision um, on the boundaries eventually. And I did realize that we made a, um, we selected a December 3rd date as a possible community forum. That, I wanna let you know that that will probably change because of the Christmas parade that I just learned at. Uh, was scheduled on the same evening so we'll work on the changing that with um, Bob Templeton and I'll get that back to you but every every other date looks like we're on track all right any other questions comments any other priorities if you think of something let Dr. King Cannon know yep let me know and we can change them I think it's a great start I think um, these parameters with the addition of the the feeder um, priority pretty much covers everything. So, all right. And with that, if there are no other questions on the attendance boundaries committee parameters, then the board will go into closed session to discuss personnel under Texas government code section 551.074 and real property under Texas government code section 551.072. Great, thank, thank you. you all. Okay, good evening everyone. It is 548 and the board will reconvene in open session. Mr. Camden uh, had to step out for a minute so he will, he will rejoin us shortly.
Uh, but we'll move into recognition a little bit early. Um, so with that, Elizabeth? Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. First up are our advanced placement scholars. This oh, year, the college... Hey, Elizabeth, I'm sorry. I forget this every time in my three times. Um, <laughs> but any parents, parents in the, uh, in the uh, crowd, please uh, get comfortable coming up to the front and taking as many pictures of your kids as you want to. Um, it may embarrass them a little bit, but that's fine. Kids are used to it. Um, so please um, make yourselves at home. Come up, take pictures, take your time. Um, we want to make sure that you have proper time um, to get good pictures of your kids during this recognition. Yeah, Thank and you. if your student is um, in college, has already left for college, and you're here, you can come up and represent. Yeah. yeah. It's a big deal, except on their behalf. And don't worry, for the students being embarrassed, we're going to make all the police officers out here stand for several pictures, too. So oh, yeah. <laughs> don't worry. Double whammy. Yes. Okay. Advanced Placement Scholars. This year, the College Board is honoring 102 Belton ISD high school students as AP Scholars. These awards are given to students for college-level achievement as demonstrated by their performance on AP exams. The awards are divided into four categories, AP Scholars, AP Scholars with Honors, AP Scholars with Distinction, and National AP Scholars. The number of these awards earned by Belton ISD students has been steadily e increasing from 23 in 2010 to a total of 102 this year. The following students received scores of three or higher on three or more AP exams, qualifying them as AP Scholars. First up, Rachel Adcock. Next is Megan Covington. All right, you got to stay up here. And then Brooke Walleen. <laughs> Next group. The following students received an average score of at least 3.5 on all AP exams taken and scores of three or higher on five or more of these exams, qualifying them as AP scholars with distinction. First, Marcus Ake. Next we, next we have Macy Davis, Macy. Jacob Jimenez, Mariah Montgomery, Kristen Namfong, Riley Parker, Alec Ramba, And Katherine Shelburne. Amen. This is the group of the 102 scholars that we have with us. Many of those on the list were seniors that have already graduated, or there are super involved students that couldn't be with us tonight. So we're going to take one group picture. We'll let the parents come up. And there's one other group amongst these students that I'd like to recognize. We have three juniors that reached a very special de designation and one graduate. Marcus Ake, please step forward. <laughs> Jacob Jimenez, Alec Ramba, and Katherine Shelburne. These students were recognized as National AP Scholars for receiving an average score of at least four on all AP exams taken and scores of four or higher on eight or more of these exams. <laughs> You'll recognize Catherine and Alec are, are graduates of Belton High School. Catherine, you, where are you headed this fall? Princeton. Alec, where are you headed? Princeton. UT. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you all for coming back. 
I'm officially done now. <laughs> and board, I'll tell you, a, I'll give you a little hint. Um, we've got some commended and national merit scholars among this group too. That'll be coming up later in the school year, but we have some, some kids in this group who are, have done very well on the PSAT. Awesome, well done, well done parents. Thank you all. Congratulations, thank you all. Kids are saving these parents some money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are. We, yeah. Well done. Next up is another Belton High School student who had quite a busy summer, distinguishing herself nationally. Belton High School senior Julia Garcia competed against the best young golfers in the nation at the 70th annual U.S. Girls Junior Golf Championship last month. Julia earned her spot to play at Poppy Hills in Pebble Beach after winning a USGA Junior Qualifier in Idaho. Julia is a member of the Lady Tiger Golf Team and is a past state qualifier. Um, congratulations, Julia. Thank you. And with us, and with us tonight, I'd like um, to ask the new Lady Tigers golf coach, Eric Regeer, to step forward. <laughs> well done, Eric. He's so lucky to get a ring. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Congratulations, Julia. Way to go, Julia. Julia also had a uh, 69 and a hole in one this past weekend at Wildflowers Club Championship. <laughs> so nice work on that as well. <laughs> this is a bigger deal. But. <laughs> Thanks, Julia. Yeah, she's a good one. Next group, the Belton Police Explorers. This program is an educational training program for Belton ISD students interested in law enforcement. The program begins with students spending two weeks with officers learning tactics, techniques, procedures, and all the rules involved with being a police officer. After graduation, they receive the recognizable Red Explorer shirt you're about to see and continue on in service to the community at various public and district events. Most recently at Project Apple Tree, we had a group of students. Um, this program is another example of how the Belton Police Department is actively engaged in creating opportunities for our students. Um, first, I'm going to recognize the officers involved. Um, we have Deputy Chief Jen Wesley. She's back. Come on up. Come on, come up, on Jen. up, Chief Wesley. I was told that you wouldn't come. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Lieutenant Fields. He'll come. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sergeant Kim Hamilton. Officer Dane Cantro. <laughs> Officer Chris McDonald. Yeah. Officer Gerardo Torres. I'll move to the center. Officers, we'll let the explorers line up between y'all. So now we're ready for our students. Ezekiel Moreno. <laughs> Jordan Richards. Jasmine Gutierrez, Darren Watkins, Abby Howell, Cameron Diaz, Mariah Locklear, Mariah St. John, Bailey Story, and Aiden Rivera. Look forward to seeing these explorers at football games coming up and other public events. Thank you all for what you're doing. I think they're okay. We got to get them earlier. <laughs> Squeeze in. You guys could step up. Um, Dane, you guys could step up on this ledge here and the kids can back up. There you go. It's okay, I am too. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a lot of us back here do. <laughs> okay. Thank y'all. All right, thank you guys. Before y'all leave, 
Um, Explorers, thank you for all you do. Um, I've seen you guys out working football games, um, and what you're doing isn't easy. Um, we appreciate it. And to our SROs, the officers that work with these kids, thank you all so much. The work you do uh, day in and day out, we appreciate. But the extra work that you do working with the Explorers means a lot. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you all. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Sergeant. Chief Ellis. Okay. Chief Ellis, thank you as well. We sure do appreciate all you do for the school district, and, and thank you for coming this evening. Sure, absolutely. Come on up. One of your new employees, uh, Doug Taylor, <laughs> was instrumental in the uh, start of this program. Yeah. So he's very, uh, very instrumental in the, in the actual foundation of starting that. So uh, a little shout out to him. Uh, he has stolen a, a great person. <laughs> yeah, he's, we appreciate it. It's great to have him here. He's an officer with a big heart, and we appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Okay, our next group. Another group that's not used to being at the front of our boardroom that's usually at the back. <laughs> Each year, TASB develops a media honor roll to recognize members of the press who make the effort to get to know the superintendent, board president, and the district's mission and goals, report school news in a manner that is fair, accurate, and balanced, and give a high profile to good news stories about schools, or visit our schools, or maintain a policy of no surprises by sharing information with school representatives. In March, the Board of Trustees nominated the following journalists for inclusion on this year's honor roll, and they were all accepted. Um, with us tonight, we have from KWTX TV News 10, Alex Cano, Bell County Bureau Chief and Reporter. Alex. Robert, Robert. Mm -hmm. We're going to do a single picture. Yeah, yeah, stay up here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, Alex, you mind staying up here so we can get a big group picture? Over here? And a regular here at the, the board meetings, the Temple Daily Telegrams, Mariel Williams, our education reporter. <laughs> and someone who's visited both the boardroom and the football field in the last week, KCNTV's Curtis Quillen, news and sports reporter. <laughs> Thank y'all. Thank y'all so much for your partnership with the school district and for everything you do uh, covering and promoting the great things that our kids do. We appreciate you. Well said. Now we're moving on to the Big Red Community Partners. Tonight we're going to be making two presentations. Um, the first is the Central Texas Council of Governments Emergency Services Program. The safety and well-being of students and staff is Belton ISD's highest priority, and this year's administrative retreat, held on August 1st through 3rd, took a unique approach to safety and security using an innovation and design thinking process. The perspectives of parents and law enforcement played a significant part in this work. On the final day of the retreat, the Central Texas Council of Government's Emergency Services Program sponsored Safe and Sound Schools co-founder Alyssa Parker coming to share her story and important perspective with administrators and local law enforcement. Alyssa's daughter Emily was one of the 20 children who died tragically in the Sandy Hook school shootings, and her message as a parent and an advocate for school safety was very powerful for all who attended. Um, that included several members of local law enforcement as well as our administrators. Tonight, from the Central Texas Council of Governments, we have with us Jesse Hennage, Emergency Services Program Manager, and Becky Cooley, 911 Peace Out Coordinator. Thank you all for being here. <laughs> I 
Yeah. Wait, do you want to pause and let Becky come up? <laughs> no, she's not. She's stuck back there. Okay. Next up is the Belton Police Department Criminal Investigations Division. On that same day following Alyssa's presentation, the Belton Police Department Criminal Investigations Division and other members of the department facilitated important presentations and discussions with administrators. These open and engaging conversations strengthen our shared understanding of this community and how we work together to protect the students and staff of Belton ISD. For that and many other reasons, um, we would like to recognize the Belton Police Department Criminal Investigations Division tonight with a Big Red Community Partner Award. And this list is pretty extensive too. I get lots of um, input on who all should be recognized, so let me say these names correctly. Chief Jean Ellis, Deputy Chief Jen Wesley, Lieutenant Alan Fields, Sergeant Daniel Ontiveris, on 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 Detective Robert Preston, Deputy Chief Larry Berg, Detective Robert Gatewood, Detective Anthony Adame. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Elizabeth, thank you for that. That was fun. Okay, next uh, we have public comments. I didn't uh, see anyone signed up. Uh, so is there anyone? Yes. Come on up. <laughs> this is kind of an impromptu thing. Okay, well, that's fine. If, if you don't mind, just state your name. My name is Stephanie Myron, and I'm a parent of a student at Lake Belton Middle School. Um, fortunately, today I had the day off. So in trying to make arrangements to make sure my daughter gets on the correct bus and that the you know that she is picked up at the same time or same place that she was last year, came to find out that there is no bus available for a group of students that live in the, in the same neighborhood that I do. Um, but we were not notified at all. And so a friend is here that she was in the same situation. And then as we were driving through the neighborhood, seeing other children just walking home, stopping and talking to parents and finding out that none of us were informed that there was there were changes made to the bus routes and that these students are now expected to walk and i'm not exactly sure why they are expected to walk we do live 1.3 miles from the school which seems you know not like a bad distance however it's extremely hot outside and the children were told that they're not allowed to have water bottles at school, so that becomes a, another concern, that they're there, they're, you know, she's in athletics, so she starts her day very early in the morning. They carry a very heavy backpack, walking up a hill both ways. Um, so it's, it's a lot, and they're, they're young, and we just weren't prepared. So when I saw that there was a board meeting, I thought, well, let me take it to the board, because I think the ball was dropped somewhere. And, Funny to follow up on, you know, something on safety. I think this is a, a definite issue for safety. Okay. Well, thank you for bringing that to our attention. Absolutely. Um, I will let you know, if you don't mind, I'm going to give you Dr. Robert Muller's name as someone to talk to about okay. that about, about that issue. All right? Thank you. I appreciate and it. And Connie, do you need, how do you spell your last name? M-Y-R-O-N. Okay. Connie, do you need anything else? Okay. Thank you. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Myron. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else wishing to address the board? Seeing no takers, we will move on to the uh, public hearing 
regarding the 2018-2019 budget and proposed tax rate. Jennifer Land, how are you? I'm well, and you all? Good. Happy first day. Yeah. yeah. It's a big day for you all. <laughs> yes. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this public hearing to discuss the tax rate and the budget. I just want to take time to thank a lot of people who have worked to, to make sure that this budget journey is culminated tonight. I want to recognize Carrie Pridemore, the Director of Finance. Carrie, just Carrie? wave your hand. You? Thank you. Thank you. She's worked behind the scenes and done a great job in, in working to uh, facilitate the budget process, as well as I want to, to thank Dr. King Cannon and Dr. Muller and the leadership team for working so hard and putting in the necessary time that it takes to build this budget. And then to you, the, the administrators, the community members, because the budget is an ongoing process. And so tonight I'm standing here to explain what we've been doing for the last really 12 months because it never stops. And so thank you for taking the time to be here to discuss this. And then I want to thank the board. Thank you board members for always being true advocates for fiscal responsibility while providing great oversight and direction for the instructional progress of our kids. So thank you for that. So let's get right into the budget priorities. So the district is, we developed the budget, and I don't have the clicker. I'm sorry. I, oh, wait, let me see if it's working. Okay. That's the old clicker. Yeah, I don't see anything. Sorry about that. All right. So we developed the budget in in keeping the priority set forth by the board and superintendent in mind. And as you can see, academic achievement and supporting our staff and ensuring quality facilities are, at the, are the central theme of our priorities. These priorities are in line with the district improvement plan and are designed to ensure that the district maintains high standards in educating our students. Our recent financial highlights as we wrap up the 2017-18 year and begin a new year, we want to take time to recognize some of the great things that has happened in the district in the past year. Once again, the district achieved a perfect score, 100 score superior rating for the fiscal year end August 31st, 2017. We received our preliminary results and that is a huge accomplishment. And coupled with the fact that the district had a clean 2017 audit, no findings, that is impressive. And also, we uh, have an extremely supportive board at Belton ISD who prior to some tax reform and changes that went on in December, they proactively approved the refinancing of bonds in December and that resulted in almost a $7 million savings to taxpayers. That is impressive. And these savings will benefit the district for years to come. So in looking at our fund balance, Belton has a strong history of, uh, uh, has a history of a strong fund balance in the general fund. And as you can see here, currently our fund balance sits at a little more than $26 million. And since 2012, the percentage of our fund balance uh, to operating expenditures has increased. It is our goal to keep the fund balance above 20%. And I just wanted to point out that the 2018 figure is an estimate, and we will have the finalized numbers once we have our audit. A healthy fund balance allows us to be able to fund some capital projects and purchase some capital assets with general fund monies. And again, this year, we, are, we have budgeted over $1.5 million for capital items, including a new roof at Leon Heights, bus purchases, and new, con new school startup costs for our construction programs. I just put the enrollment chart in here for you just to show that since 2015, enrollment has increased by over 10%, and we are expected 
to continue to grow in years to come. Certified values for 2018 came in at 3.2 billion for our net taxable values, and that is a 7.82% increase over last year. And we, again, saw substantial growth. And this next chart is designed to be a more granular depiction of property tax values. As I mentioned previously, our next net taxable values came in at 3.2 billion. However, I wanted to show you that we actually started with an assessed value of $4.3 billion. But due to tax exemptions that are allowed, tax exemptions such as homestead exemptions, disabled veterans, and agriculture, we arrived at a net taxable of $3.2 billion. However, that is not the amount that we get our tax revenue, that we generate tax revenue from. We have some additional adjustments that, it, that are made. One is the freeze taxable amount. That means the tax value for over 65 and disabled persons where they have their property values frozen. So that we, that's about a, almost a half a billion dollars for us. And then some small adjustments made by the CAD or the Bell County Appraisal District. And that leaves our freeze adjusted taxable amount, which is the amount that we generate tax revenue based on. That's at about $2.8 billion. And we also, there are three funds that the board has to approve legal or has to legally adopt, general fund, the school nutrition fund, and the debt service fund. So we're going to talk briefly about the general fund and go over the, uh, the, the assumptions as well as the budget. And during the budget process, there are several revenue and expenditure assumptions that have to be made in each of those funds. And in the general fund, there are items that change or that may fluctuate a little bit, but some items after the board, after the budget is adopted, they're a little bit more stable. And that's our maintenance and operations tax or our tax rate at $1.17. And then local property values, again, like I said, they grew 7.82%. And then our state property values, which the state uses to determine how much federal assistance or state assistance we'll receive. And our projected enrollment, which directly correlates to ADA, we have to monitor those two items. Those are the two, two areas that may fluctuate a little bit. So we monitor those throughout the year. In terms of expenditures, we, are, we used current staffing guidelines, and we did not change those from previous year. And we use those guidelines to determine the additional classroom teachers that were needed for growth. And for campus discretionary allotments, we used a per pupil amount, mint, uh, amount. We had a base amount as well as a per pupil, and that determined each campus's discretionary allotment. Our insurance contribution did not change, but it remained at $375 per person, which is still a very healthy district contribution compared to surrounding districts. And we also budgeted for some capital improvement items in the general fund. Fund that we will use primary that we will use fund balance to procure these two we this includes the two special education buses uh, the roof at Leon Heights and some technology items that will be supported by e-rate reimbursements additionally we could, we will continue with our school bus lease as well as a technology lease that we have and we address personnel by budgeting initial, initial personnel FTEs for the opening of Charter Oak Elementary. And at the board's approval, the district has bu budgeted and provided a 2% salary increase for employees. In 2018-19, we anticipate over $99.7 million in general fund revenue and I just wanted to test everyone to see if they were wearing their glasses or could squint well enough to see these next few slides. Uh, and uh, as you can see, most of our revenue is made up of local revenue and state revenue, with state revenue being uh, over 60% of our total income source. And we have some federal revenue, about 2%, that's generated from SHARs and MAC reimbursements, as well as a small amount for impact aid. 
In terms of the general fund expenditures for 2018-19, they're projected to be at 100.3 million, and over half of our expenses are directly related to the classroom. And another 20% library, curriculum, school leadership, counseling, social work, health service, transportation, is geared toward direct campus and student support services. So when you couple those two together, that's uh, over 80% of our expenditures that we are directly supporting kids with. With the general fund, here's a different de depiction of the expenditures in the general fund. And as you can see, 80% uh, of our costs are directly related to personnel, the people of the district. And this is in line with other districts across the state. Switching gears a little bit, our historical tax rate, and our tax rate is, it, it determines how much tax revenue would be generated. It is shown in this chart, and prior to last year, you'll see that the tax rate had not changed in three years, but with, with the voter-approved referendum, the tax rate increased last year to support the issuance of new debt. A little bit more granular look at the proposed tax rate. After much discussion and consultation with our financial advisor, we are proposing that the tax rate remain the same at $1.60.3. This is comprised of $1.17 for the M&O portion. In 2008, taxpayers approved a $0.13 cent ratification, which allowed the district to generate additional revenue to support the maintenance and operation areas of the district. Uh, I would like, first, well, this, Belton is one of few districts, and I say few, uh, that has the 17 cent or additional 13 cent. So the tax, thank you taxpayers for seeing, for having the intuition and for going out and approving this because this allows us to do more. And as you will see later, as our tax values increase and the amount that we get from our uh, from our property tax increase, our state revenue, it decreases. So there is an inverse relationship. But thank you voters for approving this and continuing to support the district in approving the 2017 bond. And you see the fruits of that that's going around in the district. And with that, you supported the tax rate of 43.3 cent. Our goal is to keep the tax rate as low as possible, but we have to be fiscally prudent with doing that. And again, after discussing the options with our financial advisor, we're proposing to keep the INS rate at the 43.3 cent because we still have about $19 million of, of debt that we need to issue that's related to the 2017 issuance. So we need to go out and sell about $19 million more in bonds. Also, our fiscally conservative measure this year will hopefully allow us to be able to pay down some debt, some additional debt, about $1.3 million, and create an opportunity to lower the tax rate next year if there are no significant changes. We know there's a legislative year coming up, so there might be some changes, but that's what we were working with. That was our goal in mind. And as you can see here, even though we are proposing to keep the tax rate the same, our taxpayers are still impacted due to the increase in property values. So an average taxpayer can expect a dollar, $112 increase in their property taxes over last year simply because the property values increased. Because as you can see here, the average market value increased from 170,000 to 177,000, and the average taxable value of a residence went, it increased from 145,000 to 152,000. And that in turn makes the tax liability a little bit larger. And I wanted to mention, too, that because our, even though our revenue will increase, our state revenue per pupil will decrease. And as I mentioned, this is that inverse relationship, and it makes an increase in property values almost a zero-sum gain because you have that, it's a give and a take. So, can I ask a question yes. 
we don't realize any of the 7.82% based on the state's way that they figure the counterbalance. We don't really see that. We do, we do this year because it's considered a windfall year. So the, the property tax system or the school financing system, the property tax values have a year lag. So we will each year, the, we get revenue based on prior year property tax value. So as your property tax values increase each year, you're working on the previous year and your state revenue is decreasing. So, and that's called the windfall. And when you get to the year where your property tax values don't increase as much or you don't receive a gain or realize a gain in your property tax values, that's the year your total revenue will decrease. We're good, We're good this year. Yes, we are. And again, this is just one other depiction of how the, the, we, the state the burden is shifting from the state to the taxpayer. I talked to a lot of folks and reiterate the fact that the appraisals come from a different entity than the schools. Yes. We, we utilize the Bell County Appraisal District, and they are the ones, <laughs> I'm looking at Mr. Floor, the appraisal district is the entity that sets the property values. It is not the school district. Thank you for pointing that out because that is a misconception. So moving on to the school nutrition budget. This is the, another fund which must be legally adopted. The budget must be leg legally adopted by the board. And once again, we made assumptions regarding revenues and expenditures. The district implemented a 10 cent increase in student lunch prices this year. And this increase is the result of calculating the paid lunch equity, which increases the price required for students who pay for lunch. So this is a, a component that, that T, Texas Department of Agriculture sets forth and we have to calculate that each year and determine how much, if any, we need to rate, raise lunch prices in order to be compliant, in compliance with that rule. And on the expense side, we included $285,000 in capital equipment purchases to maintain an acceptable fund balance level. As you can see, revenues, next slide. Revenues for the school nutrition budget is primarily made up of funds we receive from the National School Lunch Program. And we are proposing this year a revenue short budget because we cannot carry forward more than three months of operating expenditures and fund balance. And we are slowly approaching that limit. So we are trying to be proactive and make sure that we don't get, get there. And we have our food service director, Rob Pashisnik, which I don't see him in here, he's done a great job in ident identifying campus needs and making sure that we spend those money, the money on some capital expenditures for the campuses. I think we got some new tables, some furniture. So that's what, we're, that's what we have decided to do and we had to get a, approval from TDA for that and they approved it. <clears throat> so moving on to the last one, the debt service budget. This is the other budget that has to be legally adopted. And in developing the revenue budget, we used the 43.3 cent INS rate and added, and the, of course, the added value or the added property, property growth value to determine our revenue. We also included some support that we get through EDA and IFA funding from the state. In terms of our expenditures, our expenditures are standard expenditures. They are all the, the, they are the amounts that we have to pay semi-annually on our bonds. So as presented in the chart, the debt service revenue is generated mostly from tax collections. And as you can see here, we are one of few districts where the state contributes a small portion as well. 
And again, with the expenditures, those are our semi-annual bond payments. But like I mentioned previously, we, we anticipate retiring over $1.3 million in additional debt this year as well. And then last but not least, this is the budget. The, these, this is the depiction or the chart showing the, how we have estimated the budgets for the general fund, the school nutrition fund, and the debt service fund that we will ask you to approve later tonight. If you have any questions or comments at this time, we will take them. Okay, as this is a public hearing, are there any members of the public present that have questions for Jennifer? No questions? Anyone on the board? Um, also, since it's a public hearing, we will not be taking action on it now. We will take action later in the meeting on approval of the budget. But if you have questions for Jennifer now, you're welcome to, to throw them out there. How are we looking bond-wise? You know, when we sold last year, there was that, mm -hmm. they, the experts predicted a blip in the bond where we got really fortunate. How are we looking right now as far as the selling of the other $19 million? So we have, we are sticking with our plan of trying to go out for the last 19 million in the fall of 2019. And that is one reason why we maintained our tax level for INS so that we would be able to successfully do that without having to have an increase in our tax rate. All right. So market values are changing daily. Yep. We'll continue to watch with Jennifer Ritter, yeah. and she will um, help us determine the right time to sell the remaining bond funds. We are watching the interest rates. Any other questions? Comments? All right. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Appreciate it. With that, we'll move into the consent agenda. Uh, any board member... Would any board member like any item pulled from the consent agenda for further discussion? Seeing none, uh, I'd entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion from Mr. Norwood, second from Ms. Lee. All in favor, raise your hand. That passes unanimously. Thank you. And on to the superintendent's report, Dr. Ken Cannon. <laughs> yeah, that was quick. Not wasting any time. Moving right along, it was an exciting first day of school um, and things did run very smoothly overall. So we were very pleased with our day, it was busy and um, I know our administrators are looking kind of tired out there. <laughs> Appreciate them very much. They, um, the campuses that I was able to visit today um, were so impressive. The administrators were so impressive in the way that they did their jobs and took care of our children and I know you would have been um, very pleased with them as well. Um, one of the things, uh, one of the, the observations that was shared with me the most today on multiple occasions was that the new bell schedules that we implemented with the new three-tiered system did impact the traffic flow in a positive way um, around the high school. And so that was a very good outcome for us and um, really appreciative of Dr. Muller and the Transportation Department, Lucy Curley, for the work that they did. That was a big shift in a, a very important system in our school district. And uh, it's something that we needed to do um, to move to the next level as a, as a growing school district. So um, there was a nice benefit for traffic flow today and we're very appreciative of that. So I wanna share a few pictures from today that Robert Pryor has put together for us. Um, just some of the first day shots. Look at her, she's got her lovey. This is uh, at Bex, little pre-K students. Um, beautiful picture, Sue was out and about doing a great job there uh, when I went by this morning. And look at, look at these. I love that shirt. I met that little guy in the hallway, super cute, um, pre-K student, so proud of his new clothes that he had on today. Darling, and look at him. <laughs> pre-K. <laughs> 
Super cute. I could look at him all day. <laughs> uh, and this little guy, I don't know if you can see his shirt, but it says, I am ready for BISD pre-K, but are they ready for me? <laughs> and he was standing in the hall. Sweet. <laughs> Um, he, this is a shot, I believe, at Miller, I've lost track, Southwest Elementary, first day of school. I believe that's a kindergarten classroom. And this is at Lakewood Elementary, one of our students with a thumbs up there in the hallway with this principal and Mrs. Jordan. Sweet. And there's that new gym at Lakewood Elementary with a bunch of kindergartners in it. And it was being put to good use already this morning. Looks great, huh? This is one of the new music classrooms. It's quite lovely, and the teachers were so happy to have those rooms. They got in last week, were able to decorate, and um, the rooms are beautiful. And there's the other music classroom with uh, Susie Dubois' class uh, of students there. Super sweet. This is at Miller Heights Elementary at lunch. Lunch is important on the first day of school. Every day lunch is important, right? But especially the first day when you're trying to figure out how to get through that line. And here's the next one. Sweet. And when you get to middle school, you got to figure out how to get around to your classes. So here are some of our sixth graders trying to figure out how to get from class to class. Same is true for ninth grade. Those are important transitions. And if you're at the high school, like I was this morning, there are always high school kids that are asking, where is CC? Uh, 108, and where is the D hallway? This is one of our new teachers at uh, Lake Belton Middle School. I'm sorry, I don't know his name yet. Um, it's first day of school for him, too. Uh, Belton New Tech High School, one of our teachers and a student. Here's another New Tech picture. And I was at Belton High School, but I didn't get any pictures there today. I'm sorry. And I missed Jill, but I was there all around, but we just never connected. Um, and then lastly, I met this little guy named George today. Um, and I did try to talk to George, and George didn't want to talk to me. And, <laughs> and I introduced myself, and I asked him some questions, and he went, mm, mm not talking. But I asked him if he liked his teacher, and he said yes. So he, he was having a really good day in PE. <laughs> I thought you'd enjoy that, Chris. Class of 2031 right there. Isn't he cute? <laughs> Love it. And I think that's it. So we created some moments that matter for our kids today, and it was really fun. Um, our attendance count today, we were still um, trying to get a hold of the exact numbers by the end of the day, but the, the count that I have and that I can assure you will change by tomorrow and it will continue to change over the next few days was 11,539 students. That's 406 students more than the first day last year. Um, at the high school level, we had 3,400 students today, about 104 more than the last, uh, last year on the first day of school. And of course, we do expect those numbers to continue to change. And it, as um, our numbers will grow all the way until the end of October when we take that official snapshot um, count. So we'll be, I'll be sending you some daily reports for the rest of the week so you can see how we're looking. At the middle school, we had the most growth today. We had 2,725 students. That was an increase of about 193 students over last year. Middle schools, we need another middle school, don't we? Um, at the elementary school, we had 55,410 students. That was an increase of about 109 students over last year. Um, students who are enrolled and don't show up or don't or aren't here on the first day, we call them no-shows, um, but we expect them to continue to show up over the next um, few days. Most of them will get to us by Labor Day. Um, and as a reminder, our projected enrollment for this year is 11,963 students, and uh, we are well on track to reach that number this year. Any questions about enrollment numbers? 
All right, um, I'm going to go just speak um, briefly to our accountability ratings, and I'll pass it to Vicki Dean for um, your last A through F lesson <laughs> for this year anyway. Um, is it the fifth lesson? The fifth lesson, and they and they won't tell you this, but I will tell you they are tired of A through F, Vicky. They were telling me at dinner, <laughs> they're ready to move on. <laughs> we're not tired of Vicky. We love Vicky, but um, they they had some summer training on A through F, and then we've hit it pretty hard here um, in the boardroom. So uh, I think they got it. Um, as you know, 100% of our campuses met standard for 2018, and that's under the new accountabil accountability system. And our letter grade under the new A through F system that is rating districts this year was a B. Um, overall, we're we are pleased with those results, but as the superintendent, I want to continue to remind you that we want to keep perspective about those ratings and what they say and mean about the quality of our school district. Um, we consider those still, um, those ratings is only one measure of our student success in our school district. And we want to continue um, to adopt a more holistic view of uh, student success. And we want to continue to celebrate our students' achievements and academic accomplishments more broadly. Um, so a, a, through, a through F measures what it measures, um, but we're much more than what the A through F system um, measures. So um, with that in mind, then I'll pass it over to Vicki, um, who's, uh, by the way, who's done a really fabulous job with some really complicated material. And um, we can't thank her enough for the work that she's done on um, getting us to understand this system. So Vicki. Five for five superstar. <laughs> Good to have you back. Well, thank you. Um, this is our, like we said before, our final presentation on the A through F. Um, this is part five. So what um, we're going to do this evening is kind of review our learning and then um, go through and break down um, A through F on those domains where before we'd just been using just um, fictitious um, data. Now we're going to look at um, Belton ISD's data and how we got the 83 score overall. So as we go through, um, <clears throat> of course this A through F um, aligns to our district and vision, right, um, and our goals. Um, and as a reminder for, um, for any of you who's in the audience, um, all this came about from House Bill 22, the 85th um, state legislature, legislature that said we must um, come up with an accountability system that rates um, districts and then campuses um, according to a letter grade. Um, and to review, how do we get that um, overall score? Um, we went to three domains where domain one looks at student achievement, domain two looks at school progress, and domain three looks at closing the gaps. And um, domain one and two, it's the best of um, one of those domains. Multiply that times 70% of your overall score. And then domain three of closing the gaps is 30% of your score. So that's what we covered um, for um, part two, three, and four. So the review domain one looks at um, for elementaries and middle schools is strictly from STAR data, STAR and STAR Alt 2. And then high schools and districts, um, it takes into account not only your STAR data, but also your college and career military readiness data and then your graduation data. And it's, um, it takes a percentage of each one of those, but looks at different groups of students. So our STAR data is from this current year. Um, our college and career military data comes from last year's graduates in 2017. And then our graduation rate just takes it from the best score that we've had in, la in the last three years. Yes. On the uh, CCMR, the graduation uh, military preparedness thing, mm -hmm. when it says component score of 46, 
Can you explain that in, in a little bit more in depth? Yes. What is that? Is that just a, do they know percentage of the kids that graduate, how many go on? Is that how that works? How, what does that mean? Okay, so I, we'll, we'll talk oh, about that we'll here. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> Okay, so what does, what does Belton look like in Domain 1? So if you look at our star data, and it's, um, I don't think I have a pointer on this thing, but um, it takes into account the percent of students that approached, so passed um, in the old terms, um, passed, which was 80%. So you can see that in that chart where we talk about the data. 53% um, of the students um, were at meets, so that, um, and then 20% or 25% of the students were at master's level. So then it takes the average of all three of those, so 80%, 53%, plus 25%, and then divides that by three, so it finds the average of the average, and so our component <laughs> score is 53. Right. Okay. So <clears throat> that's 53 for our STAR data. So then if you look at our CCMR, College and Career Military Readiness, we had 724 graduates. So that's the domain. And of those 724 graduates, we had 332 graduates who um, – gave us a college and career military readiness score, a point. So they either get a point, if we go back to um, that presentation on CCMR um, under TSI, if they were ready in the reading and um, math component with the TSI assessment to, to take a dual credit course, or based on their SAT score, or based on their ACT score, um, we could get a point for them for um, completing the dual credit class, um, a point for them if um, they score three or f um, higher on an AP exam, um, and then or if they plan to enlist in the military, or we can get a half a point for those students who um, have an articulated um, Kate sequence, um, a CTE sequence. So. We might have students that might have a point in all of those, but we only get one point. So once you, a student gets that point, um, we already have that point for that student, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, so, so that equates to 46. So a component score in the eyes of the state is a percentage in some instances. And then our graduation rate was the highest one out of those three years was 98.7. So then the state says, okay, we don't know what a 53 means in the world now, right? And so then they scale that over to what does that equate to? So a 53 is an 84 scale score. And then a 46 is a 75, and then graduation rate equates to a 95. So then it converts those to those skill scores, and then it multiplies it by the 40, 40, 20. So for domain one, Belton ISD's overall um, score is an 83 mm -hmm. for domain one. Congratulations. Yes. Less important. One quick question, because I know when they, I mean, HB 22's come out, now we have it, we all kind of get it now, but how much of this on that, the uh, CCMR, is a product of tracking, which we probably weren't even tracking this stuff as close then as, I mean, campuses are going to have to start ramping up their tracking abilities mm -hmm. to try to up that number. Because uh, if you look at this, it looks like, well, less than 50% of our students are leaving with a point in any of these Thing. So how much of it is just tracking? So it's, um, part of it is tracking. Part of it is, um, this was last year's graduates, where the rules did not come out. The right. accountability manual didn't come out till this year. Actually, the final accountability manual didn't come out till February, not until 2018. So we're, we're having to go back and look at, and some of those indicators 
um, are things that we report to the state, and then some of those indicators come from College Board. So it is, it's getting data from College Board, getting, making sure that our data is accurate. Um, yeah, so it's, it's taking the 3,400 students that are at the high school and basically having a gigantic spreadsheet and making sure, you know, who has... That they get some point counted. somewhere along the way. Yes. Yeah, it's a, it's a really great point because that's a really complicated component um, depending on the, um, you know, depending on the offerings that you have in your school district, students' ability to pay for those dual credit courses, AP exams, right. and, um, and so that isn't... Um, comparable from school district to school district. So one of the things that we were looking at um, in last week as we were we were sifting through those ratings was, you know, what kinds of school districts were were maxing out on those CCMR points and in school districts, some school districts that were are smaller school districts where the English four class is the dual credit course. So every student um, automatically gets a CCMR point for that. So um, so there are a lot of variables in there that make that, um, I, th I think, make it hard to compare one district to another. And then there's some some pieces of that that are, that are tied to funding, quite frankly. And so um, what we'll have to do as a school district is to go in and look at how we, uh, where we can improve and how to maximize our points under the new system. And so we've got some things in our district improvement plan to, um, to help us in that area, paying for the TSI for all students is one of the things that we'll be doing. We'll be work, continuing to work on SAT scores, um, and you'll, you probably have seen in the district improvement plan that we'll present tonight that we are looking at some PSAT prep courses and those kinds of things that, that we've already been working towards. Um, but there are a lot of variables in the system um, that make it difficult for you to judge one um, you know, compare yourself to other school districts. And it is, it is a unique, it is unique because the size of the district can determine what kinds of courses that you can offer. Um, your funding can um, have an impact on what kids can get to take or not take. Yeah. If that makes sense. So based, <laughs> it's pretty complicated. Saying, we'll be able to break down this data, you know, the, the 332 out of 724. Can we break it down into demographics and No, you're great. You're, it's exactly what you're saying and what Jeff's saying is we'll be looking at individual students moving forward and how they can get credit under CCMR, whether that be a TSI score, an SAT score, um, uh, going into the military, taking a dual credit course. And so we'll be watching them. It'll also be how they um, perform under STAR. And so the work that we've been doing in writing um, to improve our English scores, that's, that's all going to contribute to improvement on this system as well. So um, we've been working along these lines. However, we didn't have the criteria, but they're good things for us to work on. Right, right. Yes. Yeah, so when we look at this year's graduates, next year's, last year's, well, the graduates of 2018, we already kind of have, we started looking at them. Um, and then the current senior class of looking at them, the current junior class, just like Jeff asked about, you know, so it's a, it's a massive spreadsheet mm -hmm. tracking all so Just like we, you know, we, you track your graduates to make sure they pass the STAR exam so you can get them graduated. We'll be tracking to make sure we get kids credits in these areas. And we know the criteria now. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. so two we years, know the game. Yeah, hope so. Yeah. <laughs> Until they change it. Until they change yeah, it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the commissioner has said it should be in place for five years. Um, of course, you know that's all depends on the legislature. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so um, so that's domain one that looks at um, STAR, CCMR, and graduation rate. Um, to review domain two, which is school progress, part A looks at academic growth from one assessment year to the next assessment year. Um, and then part B looks at relative performance. How are we performing 
with STAR and CCMR averaged together with our economically disadvantaged percentage and how are we performing with other districts that are the same percentage as us. So with school progress, when we look at that data, um, we were at our component score was 69. So we, um, we had 69% of the students that either um, made progress or maintained where they were the year before. So that's, um, which equates to a 79 scale score. And then um, part B, which is relative performance, is um, they take our STAR score and our CCMR score, add those together, divide by two, which is averages to 50. And then they graph that with the 45.4% um, SES, and our scale score then becomes a 76. So then we take the highest score from um, domain two, which is the 79. So, um, so then when you look at domain one was an 83, domain two is a 79, so it uses the higher score, which is an 83. So when we get to our final calculation, it uses the 83. So that's domain two. Mm. Mickey, I don't, I don't know if this is the most appropriate place to say this or not, but I want to point back to a previous chart that showed that we had 25% of our students mastering all tests that they took. So to make progress, you have to move up. Um, and if you're already mastering and you slip down maybe to the, the, meat. the meets just below, it could be one or two test questions, you do not earn a point under the system. Correct. Is that correct? Yeah, so there's, uh, so that's a tricky, this is a tricky domain too. Um, and the idea is that, is that you're pushing more students to higher levels. But when you have students at higher levels, that can, um, that can be tricky as well. Well, that's domain two. And then, so what I said um, a bit ago, it's picking the better of scores, which is your skill score of those three. Um, and so we are going to use do our domain one score, which uh, of an 83. And then domain three looks at closing the gap. So this is where it looks at um, four different components, and we're looking at all the indicators at our um, all students, um, white students, African American. It looks at all the sub pops. It looks at your special ed. It looks at your EL students. It looks at continuously enrolled students. So there's a whole bunch of indicators that we're held accountable to in domain three. So it looks at four different components, which is your academic achievement. But in this case, it only looks at what percentage of your students are meeting and mastering at reading and math. So um, approaches is um, no longer um, calculated in this domain. It looks at your four-year um, graduation rate, which is um, last um, 2016 students. And then it looks at our tell pass data, um, our kids making um, progress on that assessment. And then lastly, it looks at, at the, for the district, it looks at how are our students performing, getting CCMR credit by those different indicators. So on this data, um, if you look at STAR, we meet 25 out of the 27 indicators which is 93%, which is then that calculate, that's 50% of our, our total score for domain three. For the federal graduation rate, we meet five out of the eight indicators that we're held accountable for, which is 63%, and that's 10% of um, our domain three score. And then for TELPAS, um, we scored 100%. Um, what was necessary, and that's 10% of our score. And then for CCMR, we met two out of the nine indicators that we're held accountable for. And that's multiplied time, that's 30% of our score. So our overall score, and on this indicator, it first takes and finds your weighted per, um, total, which is a 69, and then a 69 equates to an 82 scale score.
So now we have all this data. <laughs> And how did we how did they calculate that final rating? And so here's um, it used the the student achievement, which is an 83, and it uses the closing the gap achievement, which is an 82, and then the 83 is multiplied times 70 percent, closing the gaps is multiplied times 30 percent, and then that's added together, which equates to an overall score of an 83. Pure simple math there. <laughs> <clears throat> so taking all your learning from the over the course of the summer, um, this kind of culminates um, then taking what we know and plugging in our, our district data into this um, system. And then like Dr. Kincannon said um, a minute ago, all our elements, all the elementaries, all the middle schools, both high schools, Belton High School and Belton New Tech at Wasco met standard, um, which is, um, <clears throat> has been consistently five years in the running for that, of the meeting standard. When we look at distinctions, um, distinctions are based on how a campus performs pretty much at the master's level on all assessments. So when you're looking at reading, math, science, um, and social studies, it's looking at um, that mastery level. And then um, compared to your comparison group. So all the campuses in Belton are, have a comparison group of other of 40 other student, of, um, sorry, campuses in the state. So how does Chisholm Trail compare to other um, schools like Chisholm Trail in the state? So that's how distinctions are calculated. So you can see we earned 29 distinctions this year, um, and that's broken down um, by campuses. We did have one campus that got a distinction in every single area, Tarver Elementary, and that is worth noting. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad Dr. Cannon showed pictures from the first day of school, and these are some of my favorite pictures. Um, you know, it's kind of hard to pick <laughs> pictures um, when when we say, "Okay, what does this all mean? What does this all mean?" We we have an 83. What is what does an 83 mean? And so, by using looking at our data, looking at our strengths, and looking at our weaknesses. Um, there are things that we continue to do and y'all continue to support. And um, of those things is we have um, aligned, well-written curriculum documents in Belton ISD that are reviewed and revised um, when needed with the feedback of teachers yearly. Um, we have high quality professional development that um, y'all support um, when we think about Teachers College with the Writing Institute over the past couple of years, Math Solutions, Academic Language, um, AVID Path Training that was provided um, at secondary campuses this um, past summer. When we look at content days where we bring teachers in and really hone their craft and look at those documents um, to make sure that we're providing high quality um, instruction at, in the classroom. Um, and that isn't going to change. And as you, as we slowly um, make progress and increases, because even though it, an 83 is this number, but when you break down that data, we've made growth um, in areas um, across the district with um, you alls support. And when you look at that, and then also being able to provide high quality research based um, resources. Um, in our classrooms. Our teachers have high quality materials, high quality resources. Um, you know, the Beef Foundation this past year um, funded quite a few classroom libraries. We're funding um, high quality classroom libraries um, so that kids can constantly um, be reading in the classroom. So those are all those things that um, 
as we look, it's just um, continuing that hard work that we're already doing, that the number 83 doesn't, doesn't say, but when you look at it, um, we are. Um, but then, as we looked, as Dr. Hincannon um, mentioned earlier, um, when we look at, okay, so what are some things that we do need to, um, to look at and maybe um, tweak and improve and put into place? Um, Y'all are going to approve a budget that has, um, we already wrote in there that we were going to assess all students on the TSI um, this coming year. We had already looked at that. We had already, um, the high school had looked at what are ways to make sure that we support students at that next level of taking the SAT and the PSAT and the ACT and offering time for kids to, um, to have that prep and to learn those strategies since they are, <clears throat> are different than taking the STAR exam. So, um, so <clears throat> as I look at these pictures and I look at our data and look at the things that we're currently doing, um, we'll continue that path. And then um, we'll, when we find that, oh, there's some places that we need to grow, um, the campus leadership along with our department and with y'all support, we're, we're doing those things. So um, I think that's kind of... What does this all mean? Um, <clears throat> and as you can see from our pictures, um, there's some things in, in those pictures that the number 83 um, doesn't show that we're doing. Does it measure it? All right, well, I appreciate um, the opportunity <laughs> to um, spend five months with y'all. <laughs> kind of like, what am I going to do next month? <laughs> I, I appreciate it, and I appreciate y'all to ask um, questions I've asked and um, the support that y'all have um, given us. Um, I really, I, this was a great opportunity. I appreciate it. Thank what you. What you're doing is very important. That's the point person for this dissemination of all this stuff. That's, right. That's a big deal, right? Dr. It's a very big deal. It and is. she's Thank done it beautifully. She has. It's very comforting to know that the person, persons working on this on the district level are incredibly knowledgeable and we can come to you with any questions and it's it's been very very informative thank this you it's so easy to understand <laughs> <laughs> yes. i appreciate it well, thank does you. anyone have any other questions for vicky <laughs> right. vicky thank you again appreciate you all right up next dr ken cannon with the district and campus improvement plans. All right, I'm gonna piggyback on um, everything that you've heard because it's all connected. The budget, the rating system, the campus and district improvement plans, it all works together. And so you are required um, by law to approve a district improvement plan and campus improvement plans each year that are tied um, to student achievement objectives. And so we have presented you with those. And I want to take a minute just to talk about some of the priorities that, um, that I have shared with our principals this year. Um, I shared these with our new teachers and our principals have been charged with um, sharing these on the campuses. And these are, um, these priorities are embedded in the district improvement plan. And these are the things that um, are really important to us this year and that we're, go we're going to continue to work with, among other things. Um, first is, the, is creating supportive campus cultures. This is one that we've been working on a while. Can't measure culture in an A through F system. But culture is, is driving um, the success, I think, that we're having in our schools. And it's that connection with our parents, it's safety and security, it's how kids feel about coming to school. Um, and so we're going to continue to work on um, safety and security elements, our No Place for Hate program, culture in general, a little bit of social emotional learning in there, but we want our schools to be really great places for kids. The next one is, of course, passion of mine, implementing the district's curriculum <laughs> and instructional practices across all content areas with an emphasis on writing. Um, we've been working to improve writing steadily, and uh, we have a, a long history here of working on our, our curriculum documents that are aligned to the state standards. We have them for, for all of the all content areas and grade levels, and they are developed with the input of teachers. And when teachers come into our system, 
we ask them to follow our curriculum documents and that system is very important to us. The next one is focus, focusing on each student's unique academic, behavioral, and social emotional needs. Um, this is going to include our Safe and Civil Schools program, the work that we did this summer with Bridges, uh, the work that we did last year with Solid Roots, our social emotional learning initiative and the work that Dr. Warren is going to lead for us and help us to continue to get better there. Um, this area also includes conscious discipline at pre-K um, and anything that we do to help push our kids forward academically, behaviorally, and socially. And then uh, the last priority there, this is one um, that I have um, worked, we worked on steadily last year, but it's been kind of one of my projects is advancing our highest performing academic students. And I want our, our top students to um, be pushed and I want to push them harder. <laughs> so um, we're going to continue with our scholars program. We're gonna push that down a little bit uh, this year into uh, the elementary schools some more and um, continue with our work with SAT and trying to get more National Merit Scholars in Belton ISD. If you go to the um, actual district improvement plan, one of the things that I do each year, that's a, a pretty lengthy document. Um, it's built on the board's six goals. And so I like to pull out some things to highlight to you um, just, as a, just as a summary of what's in there. Um, goal one has to do with the business operations of the school district um, long range planning and processes and you can see uh, a list there of things that we want to accomplish this year. Uh, of course attendance boundaries, um, continuing our bond program and some construction prog projects, working with our financial advisors um, to sell the remaining bonds for that 2017 bond program. Um, continuing to refine our five-year budget forecast um, as we look to, to the opening of new schools. That will be really important for us. Um, and then conti continuing to implement that three-tier three -tier busing system, um, as well as implementing the E-rate plan for technology and then um, a an attendance handbook um, that details our business rules. Uh, for capturing and reporting student attendance. We started some of that work in this last year, Dr. Muller did, and, um, and we're making some progress there. Under goal two for student achievement, um, a long list of things there. I won't read all of those to you, um, but might mention a couple. Um, it, initiating an elementary scholars program for fifth grade students, qualifying for the Duke TIP program. Um, in connection with that priority to advance our students. Um, uh, working on campus culture with students who will be entering the ninth grade in the fall of 2019 and attending Lake Belton High School in the fall of 2020 so they can gain some school community and identity prior to moving into their new school. Um, developing a district level curriculum master in Skyward, uh, which is basically how we name and number our courses which is really important now that we have, we will have two comprehensive high schools and so we wanna be consistent. Um, studying our needs for special programs and making some recommendations for staffing for the first and second year of existence of new schools. Our programs are full. Our special programs um, are, are um, there we have, we have a number of special programs but we, would, we need the ability to spread those out among some new campuses. Um, our numbers are growing within those programs, and so we need to make some decisions about how we will do that. Um, of course, um, continuing to review our digital citizenship curriculum and using some new resources there. Um, and so those are the ones I'll highlight there. Goal three has to do with um, personnel. Um, we'll, wanna, we'll be working on staff, as soon as we uh, finish attendance boundaries, and actually Todd's already started, we'll be working on staffing budgets for Charter Oak, Belton uh, Middle School, and Lake Belton High School. Uh, we'll be inter interviewing and hiring a new principal for Charter Oak this year, if you can imagine that. And then we'll continue to work with the Anti-Defamation League um, to continue to provide some diversity awareness training. 
Under goal four, safe and supportive schools, we've uh, hit that significantly, but you can see a little more um, detail there um, uh, from some of the things that we built off of last month and um, primarily probably one we didn't talk about a lot last month was just some training for security guards through NASRO um, that Doug Taylor's working to get for us. So super excited about goal four, a lot of work to do there. Goal five is shared partnerships, uh, communications. Com communication to families will be important as we implement new boundaries. Um, we want to support our campus social media accounts by providing guidelines and best practices for account managers. And then this is going to be a legislative year. And that's all I'll say about that. Um, it'll be a hard year, I think, uh, with legislative session. So um, we'll, we'll need to stay in tune with that. And then finally, um, goal six is where we have most of our special programs listed. Most of the things in that, that section are compliance related. Uh, but we do want to continue to meet state accountability requirements, and um, that's in, not only in the, the regular system that you looked at this evening, but also we have some requirements under PBMAS, um, and the state does some additional look into our programs, and we like to monitor those to, to just uh, make sure that we're on track there. And then uh, we want to establish protocols for an elementary DAEP, um, including the use of social skills training. And so those are some of the highlights. You've had the opportunity to look at the full district improvement plan and those campus plans. Um, and this evening, I'll, I would like to bring those to you as a recommendation to approve the objectives, goals, strategies, and activities as presented. All right. Anyone have any questions for Dr. Kincannon on the... Uh district improvement or campus improvement plans? No questions? Okay, the link to the campus improvement plans was sent to us in our uh, packet, so hopefully you've had a chance to look at that, but um, if there are no questions, I'd entertain a, a motion to approve. Motion for Ms. Jordan, second for Mr. Camden. All those in favor, raise your hand. That passes unanimously. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Thank you. Okay, up next, Jennifer Land. We are now ready to take on the task of adoption of a budget for the school year. We've been through several presentations from you. We appreciate that. So I think we're up to speed. We didn't have questions earlier, um, but this is one final opportunity. Did you have anything for us? No, oh, five months. Five months. <laughs> it's been five months since I've been right. standing before. Long time. Well, thank you it's for your like, efforts. It's like putting together the pieces of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Each month you've gotten a piece, and now you get the masterpiece. Yep. It's a big puzzle. Create it. I like that. All right. Anyone have any questions? All right. Again, I entertain a motion for approval of the 2018-2019 school year budget. Motion from uh, Mr. Norwood, second from Ms. Lee. All those in favor, raise your hand. That passes unanimously. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. One more. All right, I got a crick in my neck. I can't even look that way. He's only gone. He's only gone left. All right, up next. Jennifer, you didn't leave, did you? Okay. Uh, next, we take on the task of paying for the budget. Yes. Um, by the um, passing of a tax rate for the school year. So, yes. do you have anything you need to? I just want to point? clarify something because it, it can be a bit confusing. There is required legal language that we do have to use, and that required legal language can, po can create some questions because it refers to increasing the tax rate. But the tax rate, and Mr. Floor is shaking his head because he knows, the tax rate is not increasing, but the tax rate increase that is referred to in the legal language is what I spoke about earlier because of the property values increasing the tax amount that taxpayers, homeowners or taxpayers are going to have to pay it has increased. And that's determined by the Bell County Yes, yes, the not the schools. <laughs> Perfect. That's the only clarification. Okay, thank you for that clarification. All right, 
Anyone have any questions on property taxes? No questions? All right, I need a specific motion on this one, I believe. So if anyone has their packet up and would be willing to make that motion with the specific verbiage that's in the administrative recommendation. So, do you see it? Approve the tax rate at 1.60030. Yeah, the verb is that's at the bottom of the memo. I motion, okay, I move that the property tax rate be increased by the adoption of a tax rate of 1.603, which is effectively a 4.88% increase in the tax rate. Thank you, Mr. Taggart. Motion by Mr. Taggart. Second by Mr. Floor. Thank you, Mr. Floor. All those in favor, raise your hand. That passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. And if anybody has questions about it, they can contact me. Yes. <laughs> Our tax expert. Okay, up next, Mr. Schiller. Employment resignation addition of administrative employees. Sir, thank you. Uh, tonight we do have uh, some movements we need to make official. There's three administrators that were recommended to you for your approval tonight. Um, the first one being Marcy Beck at Leon Heights Elementary for principal. Stand up, Marcy. <laughs> <laughs> Marcy um, has an educational leadership and policy uh, studies, University of Texas at Arlington, a master's degree from there, has a bachelor's of science degree in inter interdisciplinary studies um, from Tarleton State University, has been with the district a number of years. And one thing I like her is she, know, she knows all sides of the story. She started out as a secretary with the district and uh, has worked her way up, has served as a teacher, an instructional <laughs> coach. A year of that was, I think, at Leon Heights Elementary and has most recently served my kids at Sparta Elementary Assistant Principal. So we're <laughs> proud of her and, and look forward to working with her. Okay. <clears throat> we, offered, we offered Marcy the job one day and she, she started the next day. <laughs> <laughs> That's quick. Yeah. <laughs> of course, that creates some dominoes. So Courtney Christian is a uh, stand-up Courtney. Yeah, Courtney. She, she will be assistant principal at Sparta Elementary with your approval. She has a master's degree in education um, from UT, from University of Texas at Tyler, bachelor's of arts degree from, from Harding University, um, has been with the district for 12 years, or nine years with the district, 12 years in education, served as a teacher and intervention specialist, instructional coach at Southwest, and we're happy to have her fill in those shoes at Sparta. <laughs> And finally, Jennifer Atkinson for assistant principal at North Felton Middle School. Jennifer, you can stand up, Jennifer. <laughs> Jennifer has a doctorate of education degree, UMHB, master's of education degree um, from the University of North Texas, bachelor's of science from Tarleton State University, um, has six years in education, four years of those at Belton ISD, served a number of years in the military, um, has been a teacher, teacher coach, and has come from us from Lake Belton Middle School and uh, we are looking forward to her and her new role. In addition to that, you can see the 29 hires, professional hires that we uh, were working on uh, this this month. And so we're, we're ready to go for school. And uh, we have nine resignations that we've received during throughout the month. And we're working on four active teacher vacancies that we are working hard on. More vacancies. Busy month for you. Yes. I'm just recommending the administrative. All right. Well done. Okay, so we need to take action on, on the administrator piece. So I'd entertain. Let me get to it here. Uh, entertain a motion to approve the administration's recommendation of adding these new administrators. Motion from Mr. Floor. Second. From Ms. Lee. All those in favor, raise your hand. That passes unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Schiller. And to Marcy, Courtney, and Jennifer, thank you all so much for your years of service to now, but also for um, taking on these new roles. Good luck. Quickly. Yeah, and so quickly. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Kendall. Okay. <laughs> Up next, Angela Tikel. Yes, sir. 
How are you? Very good. Good. Update, update 111. Um, first reading tonight, no action. There's not anything in this update that y'all haven't already heard, um, especially since y'all all attended SLI this summer. Um, they're just still cleaning things up from the last legislative session, getting ready for the one to come next June. Uh, probably the one thing in here that, that'll affect us um, um, in the near future is the new training that board members are required to get. All of you got that in, in June, but any new board members will have to get that within four months of coming on. That's new. And then that training that you did get in June, you'll have to repeat within two years. And um, rather than announcing your um, continuing education credits in December like we've been doing for the last time they changed it actually. Now it'll be in April, the month before the next board election. Mm. Um, other than that, everything in here is really just more cleanup. Unless anybody has any questions, I don't see the local policies that they've recommended you adopt. I don't see us changing those. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. There was a lot there. Yes. Yeah. Oh, but good news is you guys have time to go through it again before we have to take action on it. Thank you, Angela. Appreciate it. Uh, as Angela said, we are not taking action tonight. So on to the next item, which we do need to take action on, is the resignation of two current trustees, um, Mr. Camden and myself, have both um, submitted our untimely um, resignations from the Belton ISD Board of Trustees. And we do need to take action on this. Uh, very briefly, I'll explain um, my reasoning. Leo's welcome to if he wants to. Um, but I have um, taken a job outside of the area um, and will be moving once my daughter graduates from New Tech High School this year. Uh, but meanwhile, I'm working in, in Dallas uh, weekdays and coming home on weekends, and I don't think it is fair to the district, to you all, um, or to the community uh, for me to continue to serve on the board during this critical phase of um, the boundary setting process and all the other important things that we have going on on a regular basis. So um, for that reason, I have uh, submitted submitted my, my resignation, assuming it's approved tonight. Um, so. I'd like to start off by saying thank you um, to the district as a whole. Uh, this is not something that uh, me or my family decided to do. It was something that kind of got, that was pushed upon us uh, uh, as of late. And uh, we have some personal issues going on inside the family uh, with some health and things. And so uh, we're going to, we're going to be moving around. We're still, we'll still be close, uh, but, uh, but a little bit outside of the district. And so, um, was kind of a surprise, a little, a little bit brought on, but uh, uh, I want to say thank you to the district because it's been, it's been a great, uh, it's been great several years here. I just want to say that in the short time that I've been here working with you guys, it's been, it's been really rewarding, and I've learned a lot from you. You both have brought such different strengths and, and qualities to the board, and have been a wonderful asset, and you will most definitely be missed. I appreciate that. Thank you. And so, Mike, I just want to share with you and Leah that I really appreciate your leadership and your willingness to serve kids and do what's best for this community. Uh, Mike, you've been here a long time. You've got family history here. I know that this was a hard decision for you. Um, I appreciate that. And Leo, I know that you are all in. You are all in the day you stepped in. And I really appreciate you for this. And I know that it's a hard decision for you as well, and not one that either one of you make lightly. And we will miss you greatly. Thank you. Thanks, Sue. All right. Uh, Mike, I just, one real quick thing. I remember the first day I was, you know, sworn in, and I came and sat here, and Leo was right here, and he leaned over, and he goes, this is going to be like drinking from a fire hose. So I'll <laughs> never forget that. And you've been there for me. Uh, kind of as my mentor to talk to and and I've gained a very good friend in the process and I've known the Cowans my whole life and 
thank the world of you and your whole family, your dad, your uncle, and remember him from church way back then. Just, just a great family and a great legacy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Todd. Thank you. Appreciate it. So as the new guy, uh, you know, two weeks. I know it's been a great <laughs> three months, but no. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I can't thank the two of you enough. I mean, for the support that I've gotten, you know, being the being the new one on, um, you know, to the two of you and, and to really the rest of the board. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's meant the world to me to kind of help me deal and manage with that fire hose that uh, <laughs> that, that, that Ty is talking about. Um, so, you know, just again, thank you from, for everything that you've done to kind of help me get up to speed and, and, and rolling. Um, but I will certainly miss you for sure. Thanks, Chris. Well, now that y'all are uncomfortable, I don't need to sit here and sit this longer because neither one of y'all like this. So I'll just leave it with thank y'all. Yeah. I mean, y'all both That's know perfect. I love serving with y'all, but um, you're both very uncomfortable right now with getting all this. And now Dr. Kincannon is about to make you feel more uncomfortable. <laughs> so um, I'll let her go with that. So thanks, thanks guys. Well, well I want I want to say thank you um, to this is heartbreaking. Um, these are two fine board members. Uh, Mike was on the board when I got hired, and um, I it will be forever grateful for Mike's support and for Leo's support. And uh, we wish you well and uh, appreciate you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, and now we have to take action. Before we do, um, I'd just like to say that this is a great school district um, great things happen here it's a great place a great community um, this school district um, is headed in a, um, a very positive direction and will continue to head in that direction thanks to the people that serve on this board and uh, more importantly dr kincannon and the administrators that are sitting out there every one of you you're just amazing people that do amazing things every day um, I can't thank you enough for everything that you do, um, especially for today, a first day of school and everything that you do to welcome kids, um, our students back um, with open arms and make them feel comfortable getting settled back in. Um, I know it's a long day for you, so I don't want to drag this out, but um, thank you all so much. I will miss every one of you. I will be back on weekends and eventually we'll move back um, I know I will. I just love this place too much. So <laughs> that's all I had. So I'd entertain a motion for the acceptance of um, mine and Leo's uh, resignations from the school board. Motion from Ms. Jordan. Second for Mr. Norwood. All those in favor, raise your hand. That passes unanimously. All right, we have something for both of you, and um, if you'll join me at the front, we'll get that.
At this time, the board will go into closed session. Uh, Texas Government Code subchapters D and E. We're going to discuss personnel, Texas Government Code sections 551 and 0 .074. Then we will, we will reconvene an open session and reorganize the board at that time. Thank you all for waiting. We're going to reconvene an open session. At this time, the board will reorganize. Entertain a motion for uh, nomination for presidency. I would like to nominate Sue Jordan for president of the board. Do I have a second? Here. Thank you, Mr. Norwood. All have read? All have read. Giants? Thank you. That passes. Sue Jordan is your new board president of PISD. Uh, we will now. <laughs> This time we will uh, also uh, entertain a motion for vice president. Nominate Jeff Norwood. Is there a second? Thank you, Mr. Taggart. All in agreement with that? Congratulations, Mr. Norwood. Thank you. Vice president. We'd also like to uh, entertain a motion for our new secretary. Do we have a motion for that? I nominate Janet. Do we have a second? Thank you, Mr. Floor. All in agreement with that? Okay. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. That's awesome. So, are there any issues or concerns for future agenda or administration? Are we going to discuss? Reports? Um, our plan moving forward to re appoint yes. uh, for the open positions that we have for area two and area five. We will be accepting applications. So uh, just stop by the administration <coughs> office and get your application. I believe they're online as well. Does um, application is a letter of interest and it would go to the board president. So okay. go to Mrs. And Jordan. The deadline is the September 11th or 12th. You can take them as long as you like. Um, on the 13th? 12th. 12th. We're meeting on September 12th. Mm -hmm. Right. We'd like, to, we'd like to interview starting on the uh, 12th of September. Mm -hmm. So September yes. the 11th deadline? Yes. September 11th. Will they post that on the board? We can. On the thing sure. somewhere? Sure, we'd be happy to do that. Yes, Connie. Correct. Yes. This would be a special meeting. We would <laughs> like to get this appointment done before the next meeting. For the board to do interviews. Maybe, yeah, can, can we the actually give us have a the day? Monday the 10th be the deadline to give us a day to, to go I over them? That'd, that'd be fine. Perfect. Okay. Okay. And again, that's uh, applications for area two and area five. Okay. Future events. Uh, okay. Uh, at SLI, we went through some training regarding the safety. Uh, I think Longview was the district that did it, and they incorporated a monthly safety report mm -hmm. to their board. Not only was it to report to us, but it was also to report to the public. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see if we could maybe figure that uh, figure out a way to see the progress of our of our three new members in that in that uh, realm, mm -hmm. possibly, and then. Can we do anything with capital improvement, maybe? We can do that. Um, we may want to talk about that as a team when we meet with Kay and uh, Douglas for team building in more depth about what you want. Okay. Um, we have some plans to communicate um, safety topics through social media okay. to the public, and that might satisfy um, you and what you want to tell the co community. Um, Doug and Pete are doing some really good work. And there, there could be some things that we want to highlight. There may be some things that we don't want. Um, oh, yeah. Hold on. That's, and Longview yeah. said that. Yeah. It's not, it's meat and potatoes. It's not the. Yeah, the got it. Thing. Yeah, so I think if we could talk about that in a little more detail before okay. we started that, that would be great. And then on the capital improvements, do we ask for that now or later or something to be added to the list? Or? We can add that. Um, you all did that. You have an updated capital projects list. Um, 
and we can talk about that we uh, will also and how you what you're looking for um, and would be happy to share that list and let you add anything you want to to it again yeah Chris do you have anything for future agenda or administrative reports nothing new nothing new. Janet uh, just curious about Friday reports and look ahead calendars. Are those going to continue to come out on a regular basis? Mm hmm Okay, but especially the look ahead calendar. You got you got the look ahead calendar mm -hmm. with your uh, with your board packet it was? for this week. Okay. Mm -hmm. I missed it completely. Yep, Sorry. and you'll get another one uh, this week. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Remember, we took a break for the summer. Yeah, and we started those back uh, with this board packet. Yeah. Jeff. Okay, so starting next Monday, we're going to be talking about attendance boundaries. Uh, so that's the 27th at 6 o'clock. Uh, our uh, next uh, board meeting is going to be on, um, on the 17th. So uh, we talked about looking at the applicants on the 10th or having the 10th being the deadline. We need to also keep in mind that that's a, an attendance boundary meeting night too. So, you know, after you leave here, then you'll have to make sure you go home and really review so that uh, when we interview, we'll have a good idea of where we're going. Okay. Well, uh, if there's nothing else, we are adjourned at 840. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>